All right. Well, welcome everyone to the second in the Discover Tennessee History webinar series. Uh, my name is Kira Duke, um, and I'm going to just get us started uh, today with a couple quick housekeeping things uh, before I turn it over to this month's presenter. Um, so, as we get started, uh, we are recording the session for inclusion. Um, on uh, the Discover Tennis History um, YouTube uh, listing of these, which is hosted through the Teaching with Primary Sources at MTSU YouTube page. Um, so we do ask those of you participating live to please keep your mics muted throughout the presentation. Um, and if you would, uh, if you wanna rename yourself so that when we're um, talking with each other in the chat, we know who is uh, addressing each other there. Uh, we do want the session to be interactive. So, uh, you know, again, make use of that chat box. You can find it there at the bottom uh, where your um, tools are there in your Zoom screen. You also have reaction buttons that you can use. And occasionally we will be doing polling in some of these. So that might be another way that we ask you to interact with us. Um, and also all of the resources from um, all the sessions within the Discover Tennessee History webinar series um, can be found on this Padlet page uh, and you can use the QR code there in order to access that as well as the link. Um, so this month we have uh, presenting for us um, the Abraham Lincoln Library Museum. Uh, Natalie Sweet is going to be our um, presenter and her topic is Lincolnites and Rebels Making Sense of the Civil War in East Tennessee. So I'm going to turn it over to Natalie. Thanks, Kira. And I'm going to pull up my screen very quickly. It's good to be with you all today. So the subject that I'm covering today are Lincoln Knots and Rebels, talking about East Tennessee's Civil War. Uh, we have a couple of objectives that we want to do today, but basically what we want to do is equip you to be able to talk to your students about the Civil War in East Tennessee, about the Civil War in general, but also to show them that history is kind of messy <laughs> and there's no better example of that than looking at East Tennessee Civil War. Whereas some people make it very simplified that it's the blue states against gray states. There's lots of shades in between uh, and that's no truer anywhere than in East Tennessee. As one Civil War historian put it, East Tennessee is like the Confederacy's crazy ant in the attic, something they don't really want to talk about. Um, and for the Union, East Tennessee, though, was exactly what they wanted to talk about, because for a president like Abraham Lincoln, uh, East Tennessee kind of fulfilled his beliefs of what a majority of Southerners were locked. He thought they were being controlled by our planter class aristocracy <clears throat> and that really they were truly Union at heart. Now, that really wasn't the case for every state in the Union, but in East Tennessee, it was very much true. So there's a lot of material that we're gonna to cover today. Uh, this is also a presentation that we give through our Skype in the Classroom series. And if you're not familiar with Skype in the Classroom, I'll be showing you more about that today. This presentation will be divided into two sections. Basically, you're gonna see how to talk about Civil War East Tennessee, and you're going to learn how you can take, uh, make the Abraham Lincoln Library Museum a resource for you uh, during this very strange time where we have a lot of distance learning, hybrid learning, a mix. We can still be a resource and we can still come into your classroom and actually assist you if you don't feel as comfortable uh, teaching certain materials yourselves. So would we give our Lincolnites and Rebels lessons? We're always seeking to do three things. And this is the way we kind of put it for our students when we show them. We want to address who the Lincolnites and Rebels were in East Tennessee. In other words, they're going to be able to distinguish between the two categories. Uh, answer the question, why did the three grand divisions affect Civil War loyalties in East Tennessee. In other words, we're going to understand the physical differences of the three grand divisions and how geography affected Civil War loyalties. Answer the question, how are those who were enslaved in East Tennessee treated and viewed prior to the war? And how did East Tennesseans react to the war? How were their lives affected? And that's really where we're going to get into exploring tensions and beliefs concerning unionism within East Tennessee. 
Now to set the stage for our students, uh, it's very important to first define those terms, Lincolnites and rebels. In East Tennessee during the war, Union supporters of Abraham Lincoln were often referred to as Lincolnites, and those who supported the Confederacy were called rebels. Now, given that tumultuous election of 1860, uh, the terms could alternately be used as an insult or as a term of pride, depending on who used it. Uh, for those who wished to remain in the Union in East Tennessee, Lincolnite became a sort of badge of honor. It was a symbol of their steadfastness to the Union. Now, though, if you supported the Confederacy during the Civil War, Lincolnite was an insult uh, to those who supported Confederacy. Lincoln's election uh, propels the first wave of secession across the country, the reaction to it. Lincoln's name actually didn't appear on Southern ballots during the 1860 election. And Lincoln, many Southerners feared, uh, would end slavery throughout the United States. Uh, even though Abraham Lincoln himself took great pains from the time he was elected, even up through his first inaugural address, to assure voters that he didn't believe that he had the constitutional authority to affect slavery. Uh, rebel, therefore, while it was used as a term to in, as insult by supporters of the Union, uh, sometimes we see individuals in East Tennessee who identified as rebels. It could be used as a term of pride. One young lady in Knoxville referred to herself as a very violent uh, rebel. We'll be talking about that uh, later on in our presentation too. But to really get started with talking about civil, the Civil War in East Tennessee, we've got to look at geography. And this is something for you teachers that goes all the way back to third grade social studies standards, where you begin talking about the three grand divisions of the state. And this is a map in particular uh, that I like to pull up. This is Lloyd's official map of the state of Tennessee from 1862. And one thing that I'd like to do with this map when I pull it up is to begin to ask students what looks similar and what looks different to a st the state of Tennessee that they see today. And I'd love to hear some participation as we go along because I like to participate with the students too. So would anybody like to comment on things that you see as similar or different to how the state of Tennessee looks today? Don't be shy. Cumberland River is still there. It is. And of course, the Mississippi and the eastern border. And uh, you have trails. If you look at some of the what appear to be trails and all the road network is not necessarily totally dissimilar from components today. Yeah, we can we can actually take a little bit closer look too. We also have some folks here commenting about that the uh, the shape seems to be similar, but it doesn't seem to be quite as long. So it seems like it's uh, a little wider than it is when we see it on maps now. Yeah, that's also a difference. Looks a little bit different that way. If we zoom in closely, this is an area of East Tennessee. If we have any East Tennesseans here, this is the area that looks at Claiborne, Campbell, Granger, and Knox and Rhone. And this may rely on you being a local to the area as well. For example, uh, Union County is not yet there. There are some counties that have not yet been created. That's also a preview of where the name Union might come from in the future. But yeah, we can see some definite differences. The road systems do look very simi similar. This particular map too uh, shows troop movement during the Civil War as well. But one thing that will be very important when you begin talking to your students about the Civil War is talking about the geography of the state and how the state participated in the Civil War. So if we'll remember the state 
features three stars and those three stars stand for the state's three grand divisions. That's West Tennessee, Middle Tennessee, and East Tennessee. It can also be great at this time if you have it to bring out a Tennessee state flag and ask students their thoughts on what this flag looks like and what those stars stand for. Now the city of Memphis in West Tennessee on the Mississippi River was a key location in the cotton trade during the antebellum period that precedes the Civil War. It's also a significant site for the slave trade. Nashville, the state's capital, Middle Tennessee, along with Knoxville and Chattanooga and East Tennessee, eventually become sites of key Civil War battles within the state. And I'm glad that you mentioned before those rivers, yeah. Uh, the Cumberland, the Mississippi, and the Tennessee, they make the transport of goods throughout the state easier. And that also eventually aids in the movement of troops across the state. Now, the next image I wanna show you is a topographic map of Tennessee. Just looking at this, what are some of the differences that you can note in each of the three grand divisions? The, the, Apple, the Appalachian Ridge and Valley system runs through here nicely and creates your division. And um, you clearly, West Tennessee is flatter and becomes flatter as you go east to west. Yeah. No, there's definitely different types of land features in these three divisions. Now, this is a good opportunity when we talk to students to talk about what we think that might do to affect people's lives who lives in this area. So if in East Tennessee, we see this rocky mountainous region, what does that probably mean in terms of, let's say, farming? If farming would be a lot more difficult in areas like that. Yeah, farming can be more difficult. Uh, another area I like to refer uh, teachers to when they're teaching this area is to go to the Tennessee State Geologic Survey. And you can look at the top, different types of rocks and soil. It's much more rockier, harder to grow in the eastern portion. But what do we see in Middle and West? Well, there's more farmland. Um, and as you go towards West Tennessee, of course, you would see um, larger farms um, and different types of crops being grown. Yeah, even cash crops, we might say. Uh, it's far easier to grow cash crops in Middle and Western Tennessee than it is in East Tennessee. Now, that's just agriculturally how the state is affected. What do you think travel is like in these three areas? How would people have traveled around or how easy would they have found it to travel as you look at this map? What might be some hindrances or aids as they travel along? Well, if you live close to the river, that'd be a great way to get on a barge or a boat and travel a long distance pretty quickly, but less so the, the further you go towards the mountains. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that's going to make uh, East Tennessee a little bit unique. Knoxville, which will be the center of our drama in this uh, particular story, is kind of centrally located in East Tennessee and it has lots of connections to rivers that go out, which helps make it one of the more populous areas in Eastern Tennessee. But if we look along the west and the east, we see what creates kind of like East Tennessee is surrounded. It makes it a little harder to pass through, a little harder to travel through. Uh, if you were trying to go north and south, <clears throat> your easiest location to get through the north and south will be through the Cumberland Gap, which is actually where the Abraham Lincoln Library and Museum is located, right there where Tennessee, Kentucky, and Virginia meet one another. See, if you come to where I am at, we have a gap through the mountains, and it is a sheer rock 
on either side of us. It is really the only way you can easily get into the eastern part of the state. Now, if we think right now, that's going to become strategically important later in the Civil War because the Cumberland Gap is going to be one of the access points that soldiers are on, who are on foot can enter through Tennessee down into Georgia. In the western part of the state, we have the Mississippi River that can facilitate travel. We also have in those areas, we have the Cumberland River. That makes travel a little bit easier in those areas. And as a result, we see Middle and Western Tennessee becoming more populous. Knoxville, which was located in this eastern portion, had been for a time the state capital, but by 1812, it removes further west. And as someone once said, it was something Knoxville never really got, <laughs> got over. And that's another thing to consider too, because of the way the geography is, identities began to form in the eastern, western, and middle portions of the state. And two, that geography created uh, considerations in East Tennessee, uh, ideas of the creation of their own state in this area. Does anyone know uh, one of the famed states that eastern Tennessee once almost became or would have liked to have become? Franklin. Franklin. Franklin, yeah. So the, the state of Franklin, it does not come to be, but there have already been ideas in East Tennesseans' minds in the past of creation of their own particular state. And more than that, too, along with the creation of those identities, the farming, the ability to have larger farms, more crash crops in Middle and West Tennessee will affect uh, the presence of plantations in Tennessee. There will never be terribly huge plantations as the type that we see in the Deep South, but they're more likely to be found in Middle and Western Tennessee than they are to be found in East Tennessee. There's also concerns in East Tennessee during the Civil War that Middle and West Tennessee held too much political power. And there were legal divisions between the three grand divisions from 1835 onward. Uh, the state Supreme Court held one separate session each year in each of the divisions, but there had developed over time with this creation of identity with the sense that large landowners in the middle and the west held more political power. There began to be certain animosities that grew in the eastern portion of the state. So looking at maps is really important, but maps can not only give us an idea of what an area looked like physically and how those physicalities affected the future, it also can help us think about political issues. So the map that you see here is a map showing the distribution of the slave populations of the southern states of the United States that was based on the census of 1860. This was actually the very first population map ever produced by the US Census Bureau. Can anyone think who this map might have been specifically made for? Who do you think its intended audience was? Who would it have been made for? If, take a look around the map, see if you can see any. Well, it says the southern states and the slaves uh, it must have been useful uh, for making arguments. Uh, could be even for secession. Uh, that that's what we have. They have in common, or vice versa too. That's a possibility. I don't know if the box up at the top is maybe uh, blocking the very top writing. Can anyone see what US it says? Army. It says, I can see US Army on there. So it may have military significance if they were anticipating uh, some type of operations are likely to happen. 
Uh, it's a little bit difficult to see here, but if we zoomed in, we would see that at the top of this map, it says sold for the benefit of the sick and wounded soldiers of the U.S. Army. So that gives us a hint about who it's being marketed to. Rather than being marketed to people who live in the South, it is being marketed to those who live in the North. You do have a good point about it being about the South though. Uh, the heads of the US Census Bureau and also of the Seacoast Survey are the lead individuals who take on the creation of this map. And this shows the distribution of enslaved peoples throughout the South. So the darker the color gets, the higher proportion, the number of people who are enslaved in those areas. And this is important to think about as well. It's created by government administrators who strongly believe that the root cause of the war was the continuing argument over slavery in the country and was probably made with the intention that viewers who looked at the map would see how slavery was tied to the secession crisis that was currently ongoing. And as time went on, as time passed, many at both that time and later on would use it to demonstrate that the elimination of the Confederate government could actually lead to the end of slavery. But for our purposes, and looking at it for East Tennessee, I apologize, the picture got a little bit blurry. We can see distribution of populations within Tennessee. So what's one thing you immediately notice when you look at the grand divisions? How does East Tennessee compare to the middle and Western portions in terms of population of enslaved individuals? They don't have the river valleys, so they don't have the slave population because they don't have the farmland. Yeah, there's less concentration in the eastern portion of the state. Now, if we were to look at totals in Tennessee as a whole, the U.S. Census recorded 275,719 enslaved persons in 1860. That amounted to about a quarter of the total of Tennessee's full population. And across Tennessee, actually, there were not really that many large plantations. Uh, if we look at census data, we see that 48 individuals enslaved uh, more than 100 individuals each. Uh, only one person enslaved more than 300 individuals. Uh, most had fewer than 10. That was across the board in the state. As such, uh, life as an enslaved person in Tennessee, it could vary in characteristics, uh, particularly as slavery became industrialized throughout the state. Uh, some held special skills like blacksmithing or crafting. Some worked in homes and businesses. And of course, there were those in Middle and West Tennessee uh, that worked in the fields. All, however, were subject to harsh laws and denial of citizenship or the right to vote. That was denied with the 1835 Tennessee State Constitution. And the Tennessee State Constitution also required that if an enslaved person was manumitted or given freedom, that he or she actually had to remove from the state, that they could not remain uh, within. And in rural areas particularly, we see uh, families separated from one another at long distances. And so one thing we're gonna think about here is also the mental and emotional toil of enslavement too, and how it was heavy. So a good example of the toll that it took on Black East Tennesseans, it comes to us through a book, uh, one that we actually carry in our museum, called Old Time Tazel, and it was written by a lady named Mary Hansard, who was born in 1825, and who was a woman in her late 30s throughout the period of the Civil War. 
Now, she did not write the book at the time of the Civil War. She actually wrote it much later when she was an older lady, but she wanted to write down her memories uh, so that the people who lived in Tazel in the future would know something about their families. But along the way, she came to describe incidences of the war and something that she probably didn't realize that she did was that she gave us our best glimpses of the enslaved population in Claiborne County because she relates various stories about that population. Now, it's important to emphasize when I show these documents to students, I tend to select students who are an older age. Uh, one, because it deals with terms that are slurs today. Uh, for younger students, uh, I tend to avoid these as much. And this was how she wrote her piece. So I'm gonna show you the first bit. Where did it go? Oh no, it did not include. Okay, I have, I'm actually gonna read you her, her piece because evidently that one did not make it uh, into my slide, or actually, there we go, I'm gonna pull it up. Apologize everyone. This is a primary source set that I actually uh, share with teachers as a part of this lesson set. And this is her account. William Graham Sr. owned a favorite servant named Stephen. On one occasion, Stephen had offended him. He disliked to whip him, so he concluded to punish him by bringing him into the parlor and seating him on the sofa and waiting on him all day. He brought his dinner in and made him eat it. When Stephen would want a drink of water, his master would tell him to sit still and he would bring it to him. The darky declared afterwards that he would rather have taken 50 lashes than have sat in the parlor and be waited on by his master. That conquered him and he was always careful afterwards to please his master. So in reading that primary source, what do we think about Stephen's treatment? Would William Graham have been uh, an example of a good master by the standards of the time? By the standards of the time, I guess, but he's not physically abusive, but that's emotionally abusive, you know? Yeah, it's emotional abuse. It's mental abuse. Uh, it's uh, abusing someone in, one in ways that isn't physical to the body, but has a great mental effect. And that's one way to talk about slavery with students too. Uh, occasionally we have students at the museum that will say, well, not everyone, you know, whipped those they enslaved, but we have to take examples like this too and talk about the mental and emotional toll that also occurred. There were also the separations that occurred with the families and this, and this was by Mary Hanser's own account too, this was a, a good example of what occurred. Mary Hanser also gives the next example. And I'm gonna, can everyone see it very well? I'm gonna let you take the time to read this. Can everyone see? All yeah, I'm seeing is the map. Yeah. Oh, is it not it's sure? like your, your screen sharing's maybe stuck. Okay. 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 Yeah, now we see it. All right, I'm gonna give you time to read through this primary source account.
So one way that I would use this document to talk to students is to talk to them about power differentials. Now, in giving this account, to give you a little bit about Mary Hanser's background, she came from a middling family who lived in Tazewell. They were not among the wealthiest. William Graham was among one of the wealthiest and one of the county's found founders, but they were a well-to-do family, enough so that William Graham invited she and other ladies like her to uh, dances at his house. They lived in the center of town. Mary herself would go on to take no sides during the Civil War. Uh, neither she nor her husband did. Her husband avoided war as much as they could. Uh, several county citizens did. And this is a good way to begin looking at how different people in the town reacted to the thought of an insurrection. Now again, as I noted to you, uh, there's language in the document that we would not use in students writing today, so that would be something you definitely want to talk to them about. Uh, but as you read through, how does Mary describe the event to her audience? And uh, what kind of tone do you think the document has? Well, you definitely get a sense of the the fear that people were experiencing uh, as they heard these rumors. Yeah, fear comes out in this document. It's very clear that the citizens of the town are frightened. But as we read through, who actually has the most to fear from the Knots events? I would think the black people of the community would be, have the most to fear. Yeah, they end up having the most to fear that night. Where do you pull that conclusion from? Well, I think that anytime rumors like this go around, people get agitated and you can see people are gathering up weapons. Anytime you have a gun in the first act, it's bound to go off by the third act. Yeah. You can also see it in the account of how they treated Simon the preacher. Yeah, and he's the only, Yeah, he's the only person actually seized in the entire event. And the only one who's actually almost killed because the sheriff nearly shoots him as a result of it. So based on this account, do the reactions of the different townspeople suggest how the enslaved were viewed by the white residents in the county? Well, there's also in here uh, the person who laughs about it in later years and then the man who says, I'm just gonna go to bed. So you also have people who, uh, you know, are dismissive of it. They don't, they don't really think it's something that's gonna happen. Yeah, and to give you more context on that, uh, William Graham was the largest land holder and enslaver within Claiborne County, too. Any other thoughts on this? Why might William Graham have been least afraid of anyone? Well, he probably has access to weapons and he probably can get himself to safety and get his family to self safety if he needs to. Yeah, he can absolutely do that. He's probably also accustomed to being obeyed by both white people and black people. And remember William Graham, the passage that I read a little while ago, and I'm sorry, I did have that pulled up on the screen, but evidently I was not showing it. He is also the same William Graham mentioned in this passage as well. 
it's interesting that they mention he and his wife are Irish. It, it seems unnecessary in the in a sense there, but he may have had a bigger world view of the distribution slave distribution, so that it he, he was le less likely to believe that you could get an insurrection put together. Yeah, that's also very true. He's in a position to know better than almost anyone uh, of the situation. And remember at this time too, those laws that I gave you an idea of at the beginning, and that's something to uh, discuss with your students as well. Uh, those who were enslaved had no ability to have access and to use and own weapons. Uh, they were not permitted the opportunity and the abilities to read and have an education. Uh, although sometimes they were sent on travels in rural areas like these particularly, they had had very little opportunity to actually physically travel the distance between Knoxville and Claiborne County as well. So there would be, even though there had been these rumors in these communities for years, there wasn't exactly good access to knowledge of how those individuals with that limited education with limited access to weapons how they would actually be able to find their way to Tazewell and how they would be able to take up arms and Tazewell too and again these were feelings that people who would later identify as both Lincolnites and rebels would hold throughout the entirety of the Civil War and that also then brings us I'll share my screen again. To this scene. This is taken from the March 29th, 1862 Harper's Weekly cover, a thrilling scene in East Tennessee. Colonel Fry and the Union men swearing on the flag. So first, just looking at this image, tell me what you see and tell me if you have a knowledge of Harper's, what do you know about that publication? It was mega important at the time as a communication device. It was, it was pretty big stuff. Now Harper's is one of the country's leading journals at the time period. And this image was on its cover. Out of all the significant- Like a nighttime scene and to add drama to it and there's kind of an urgency in the, their behavior and maybe beyond urgency to you know, really being upset and concerned. Mm -hmm. Also the flag, so you've got the symbol of patriotism. Mm -hmm. There's action in their poses. Are all the participants men? Yes. Mm -hmm. There are. So this is a scene taken in 1862 and it's talking about the Union sentiment in East Tennessee. You see, though we may not think about it as much today, national eyes fell on East Tennessee when the Civil War commenced. Uh, Tennessee's geography once again came into play. Those third grade lessons are moving in on us. Uh, its geography became key to controlling the war as its rivers and mountains helped or hindered the movement of troops. Now, before even national newspapers recognized this, so did the residents of East Tennessee. The region had voted two to one to remain with the Union and swift military control ensured that it couldn't break away from Tennessee as West Virginia had broken away from Virginia during the war. 
Now, controlling the ability to travel across the region was key to giving Union sympathizers a chance at liberation. And in 1861, actually, local guerrilla forces had attempted to burn and destroy nine railroad bridges in East Tennessee. They succeeded in burning five out of the nine, but very quickly, uh, the conspirators were rounded up. Uh, many were hung or others were arrested, forced to flee, or just silenced by the actions of, that they saw taken against their union sympathizing neighbors. And, and two, martial law was declared in the area, and it wasn't actually until 1863 that unionists would see the return of Union troops in the area. So what would life have been like during that time? Well, we definitely know there were leaders in the Union movement in East Tennessee, and they had various motivations. Uh, we see key Union supporters in the state that included Andrew Johnson, Horace Maynard, and famously William Parson Brownlow. And we're going to bring up an image of the fighting parson here in this in right here. Uh, the best way to describe Brownlow was a uh, stubborn, uh, cantankerous, and all too willing to take part uh, in a fight. In his youth, he traveled as a Methodist circus rider, and he also created the Whig, which was a newspaper uh, in East Tennessee that celebrated the party of Henry Clay and absolutely despised Andrew Jackson and uh, the Democrats. And even though he and Andrew Johnson would be on opposite sides uh, before and after the war and were bitter enemies, uh, they did unite at the time of the Civil War in their Union sentiments. And they were united in the fact that they had to stay with one another and stay united and stay a part of the United States. And I have pulled a primary source here for you to read. This is actually from an Iowa newspaper, but it is recounting a piece uh, from the Whig in Knoxville. When Confederates took control of Knoxville, uh, one of the first things they did was encourage uh, that the American flag disappear throughout the town. And it did. Many Unionists actually tucked the flag away for at the time. But what we see happening too is that Parson Brownlow very famously refused uh, to remove his flag and national newspapers covered it all over the country reporting on if Brownlow's flag still stood in Knoxville. Now, Knoxville was a little bit more divided than Claiborne County. And that was the account that we just looked at. Where Mary Hansard lived, over 80% of the men able to vote voted to remain with the United States. In Knoxville, however, it slid to 4951. So it was about as evenly divided as you could expect. But these are the words of Brownlow. And I'm going to give you time to read this primary source.
So reading this piece, uh, what are the first impressions you have of Parson Brownlow? He's definitely a real firebrand. That he is. If you ever want an interesting obituary read, uh, look up his obituary of Andrew Jackson. It gets far more colorful. So some background on Brownlow too, as I told you, he was a former Methodist preacher. He also had uh, owned uh, others, had enslaved others at a point in his life too, much as Andrew Johnson had done. Is a sense of abolitionism driving Brownlow? How does he see slavery fitting into this? It seems to me the most important thing to him was to keep the union together. Yes. He's driven uh, by a much greater sense that uh, the union is the most important. What would you base that belief off of? What evidence from the text? I mean, you've got some logic that's hard to follow that uh, the overthrow of slavery, if they will take place much sooner as a result of this, and I, you know, I'm not sure how he comes to that, but um, he, I'm not sure. We might say that Brownlow's being a little bit prophetic here. He writes this piece in 1861, uh, but what he's basically saying too is that by starting this war, it's going to allow for slavery to be ended far sooner than if the war had not come about. One of the things that uh, opposers of Abraham Lincoln were concerned about was the fact that, of course, they followed his career since about 1858 when he comes onto the national scene with his debates with Stephen Douglas. And one of the things they argue about is slavery. And there was a lot of propaganda that goes through the beginning of the war, uh, carrying that Lincoln is going to end slavery across the United States, which as Lincoln will emphasize throughout his time, that he doesn't have the ability as president to do that. Now, if you'll recall the Emancipation Proclamation, what is it? What, uh, it's not legislation, so it's issued by the president, so it is an executive order. Do executive orders carry the same weight as legislation put through by Congress? They can be quite powerful and put into action very quickly and it can be difficult to undo an executive order. They are, and they are designed as such. If an opposite party, however, comes into Congress, uh, it can be a challenge to an executive order. That will be one thing with Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. It doesn't officially strike the death knell of slavery. That will be the 13th Amendment uh, to the Constitution. But the Civil War helps roll things forward that will bring about the eventual 
death knell of slavery as we go through. Any questions about this so far? I'm trying to keep an eye on Tom. And I know we have a little bit of time left. The uh, actual presentation that I give when I talk to students about this is uh, far longer than what I'm showing right now and comes with more material and can actually be spread out over a couple of different class periods. But we also offer this uh, presentation as a part of our Skype in the classroom presentations. I'm going to expand that. Can everyone currently see seeing using Skype in the classroom? Yes. Great. So, uh, Part of the presentation that I gave now, I divide this into a series of Skype units that the museum can actually come into and talk to your class about and show them these primary sources. We also make the lesson plans for this unit available to you, both with backstory and context and the primary source sets. But uh, we use Skype in the classroom to connect uh, to students all around the globe. And you may be experiencing issues right now in that your classes are either, you're physically distanced within the classroom without the ability to hop on a bus, or you might be doing hybrid where you have part of the students there, part of the students learning from home. Uh, we make it to where with Skype in the classroom that we can interact uh, with you and your students, no matter what situations that you find yourself in. We offer a number of sessions, and this is just a few pictures uh, of us in action from the previous year, Skyping with some fifth grade and sixth grade classes. We do Skype tours for everyone from kindergarten up until 12th grade. We've even Skyped in with nursing homes. Uh, where we bring in our sources from the museum. We also bring in uh, 3D artifacts, at, which I show on the screen and we talk to the students about. We go back and forth and we chat. And the presentation you just saw is a longer version of one of those Skype sessions that we do with our students. So Skype in the classroom basically is a way for you to uh, schedule a classroom tour using their scheduling technology to book a tour date with us using our primary sources and our artifacts. So our two uh, sessions that we have offered for the past two years have been geared to audiences of all ages. That's our Inside the Vault, where we provide students with a general tour of the museum's collection. Uh, we pull out things like Lincoln's walking cane, his hair, the picture of his father, uh, Civil War weapons and tools, and History Mystery Skype, which is a game of 20 questions where students guess back and forth with us based on clues that we give them by showing them artifacts the subject of our museum. So they come in totally blind, not knowing what to expect and what they see. And based on the primary source artifacts they see, they find their way to Abraham Lincoln. Those are very popular tours. They're still the way that we are most scheduled throughout the school year. But beginning uh, this August, we actually added three new tours. So if you go to our Skype in the classroom page, you'll find these three tours added now. They are definitely geared with older, older students in mind. Uh, we have Julia Wheelock, a nurse's war. We hold the papers, diaries, and photograph albums of a union nurse by the name of Julia Wheelock. And we explore her experiences in and around Washington, DC. We also have a tour based on the papers of Benjamin Trail. Benjamin Trail was a free 
a black man who joined the Union Army as soon as Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation was issued. He very unfortunately died at the Battle of the Crater, but we have the collection of his letters that he wrote back and forth to his brothers, and they're a great window into understanding what it was like to be a black soldier in the U.S. Army during the Civil War. And what you just watched was an expanded version of our session on Lincolnites and Rebels, East Tennessee's uh, Civil War. We look at the maps that you've seen here. We read primary sources uh, and talk together about how East Tennessee uh, really is a Civil War and how it doesn't fit, fit into neat boxes that we perhaps assign to the Civil War when we're thinking about it generally. And each of these lessons, when you book with us, uh, each lesson comes with pre-visit lessons that you can do with your class before we begin the session. It comes with primary source packets, like the letters uh, that I shared with you in the class. Uh, it comes with post-visit lessons for uh, beyond the Skype tour lessons. And we also keep a Padlet 2, much like the one that uh, you saw for this class that we're doing today. And I'm hoping uh, the ALLM for Educators Padlet is showing, or is it still showing my Skype page? Yeah, it's I'm not just, showing. Yeah, I'm seeing a black screen right now. Okay. Uh, right, there we go. All right. We have our educators page. That's also an area where you can explore our resources that cover a variety of topics for a variety of ages. And this is the virtual tour lesson plans Padlet. And you can see how we have pre-visit tours, uh, that we have lots of content. We also have the link to our Skype in the Classroom page. So if you go to the Skype in the Classroom page, it's going to pull up our info. Yes. It'll tell you the time zone that we are in. And you can look at our sessions. And by clicking on the link, you'll learn more about each session and you'll be able to book with us. Now, you can easily access the Skype in the Classroom page in general at education.skype.com. That's also going to be in the PowerPoints that I share on the Padlet that you will receive. It's going to tell you how to create an account and how you can not only take tours with us, but there are other great uh, Tennessee sites that uses Skype in the classroom, uh, such as Fort Loudon also does tours. But if you also find yourselves teaching social studies and science, as I know my son's uh, fourth grade teacher does, uh, there are opportunities to connect with scientists all around the globe and historians all around the globe too, and to take some great field trips to national parks. So I wanted to give everyone the opportunity before we close to see if you have any questions. I do want to be respectful of your time. Yeah, I'm not seeing any questions. Jump up in the chat box. All right, well, in case you are curious after our session, I can be reached at natalie.sweet at lmunet.edu. You're going to receive a follow-up email from me after this session, providing you with links to everything that you saw here, full PowerPoints included, full primary source packets included. Um, there will also be a link to our survey uh, that will be included in that email. And of course, you will have my contact in information in case you have any questions or if we can be of any help to your students. 
I know that some of you have been with us before to learn about uh, Tennessee History Day. We are Northeast District 2s. Uh, we are the district sponsors in this area. We also are happy to help students with locating primary source material related to Abraham Lincoln, life, and the Civil War. All right, so thank you, Natalie. Um, and as we get ready to wrap up, I just want to remind you guys that again, the uh, all the resources can be found for the Padlet uh, for the Discover Tennessee History webinar series. Um, and again, that link is there on the screen for you. Um, also, uh, just to note, next month we have the Tennessee State Library and Archives team uh, going to be doing our uh, presentation. Uh, and the title for that one is A Document, A Day to Keep Your Students Engaged. Uh, resources from Tennessee State Library and Archives. Um, and then in December, uh, the Tennessee State Museum will be our presenters for this webinar series. Um, you can register for any of those um, using the link here uh, at the bottom of the screen and we'll be sure to share that with you as well. 